Enkel. <lacht> okay, so um, hello everybody. Thank you for coming. It's like a great pleasure to see so many of you uh, at this talk. I'm actually very excited today. I hope you're also very excited because we have a very nice speaker today, um, Abby Wotnik. Abby is the head of the optical physics branch in the optical sciences division at the Naval Research Lab. And uh, there she manages uh, diverse research portfolios with uh, topics in nanomaterials, laser-based imaging and sensing, quantum optics, and semiconductor optoelectronics. And her speciality, and this is how we first met, is uh, computational imaging and digital holography. Uh, but she also works on orbital angular momentum and uh, wavefront sensing. And of course, she's also the recipient of uh, several awards, including the Sigma Xi Young Investigator Award, two times the RPAD Award, the Dolores M. Etta Top Scientist Award, and an award for Navy scientists who made uh, significant contributions in their field. And um, yeah, I think I stop talking now because I anticipate there will be a lot of questions and a very good discussion. So, Abby, we are very happy to have you here today. Um, your work is very relevant to um, many things that we are doing here in the college, and the stage is yours. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks for everybody for coming to this colloquium, and it's been a fun day talking to a lot of faculty and students, so thank you guys for your time today. So the title of my talk is Controlling Light in Uncontrolled Environments. So what do I mean by uncontrolled environments? Um, we're going to go through a couple different ones. So atmospheric turbulence. So here's a picture of an airplane on a tarmac, and the heat um, creates this atmospheric distor uh, distortion. And so what we would like to have is a nice, crisp, clear image. What the atmospheric does is uh, creates this very distorted image. And so we want to be able to correct for that. So some of the things that we want to correct for might be uh, natural and some might be man-made. So another uh, situation that is challenging to image through is obscuration. So let's say an adversary puts out camouflage and they're obviously trying to hide something under there, but we would like to know what that is. Um, so we need to be able to find and be able to image what's underneath that. Um, going back to some natural uh, phenomenon, fog. Here is the U.S. Navy aircraft carrier um, in the South China Sea. The problem with fog is it makes it so we can't see our adversary and they can't see us. So it kind of has dual role. So maybe it's uh, useful um, if they can't find us, but if we want to be able to see them, we want to be able to see through this natural environment. Um, and since I work for the Navy, um, one thing that might be of interest to us is sea fog. Um, and so this was an interesting chart I found um, from the Department of Agriculture, from the Atlas on Climatic Charts of the Oceans. Um, and this is mapping out fog um, based on time of year. And um, so where you see those, this is the map of the world, but where you see those uh, shaded regions are where there is heavy fog. Um, and primarily, a lot of that fog is occurring in June, July, and August. So 32% of accidents at sea worldwide and 40% in the Atlantic Ocean occur in the presence of dense fog. So this is not only a military problem, but it is also important for commercial shipping. So in the news, the past couple of years have been supply chain issues. We get a lot of our stuff via ship from other parts of the world. We want to be able to navigate <laughs> in these dense environments. And we don't want June, July, and August to affect our supply chain because of, you know, chance of accidents at sea. So this is a issue that's been around a long time. The fog is not changing. This chart is from 1885, but this still affects us today. Um, and finally, I want to talk about turbid water. Um, so we want to be able to see things underwater. So here is a uh, um, World War II aircraft um, submerged under sea. So this might be for archaeological purposes. If we want to understand history, um, how were our planes downed and what are they doing on the bottom of the ocean, we want to be able to see them. Um, this is an underwater LIDAR, but again, because of the scattering of this light, we can't see this well with our eyes, and the laser light itself is getting a lot of scattering and reflection back. And so we, we want to be able to operate at long range 
um, and these low water clarity conditions affect that. Um, so one of the questions is why is it impossible to see clearly, impossible to see clearly in these scenarios? So for the case of fog and turbid water, the absorption and the scattering of that light impacts the incoming photons. Um, I'm going to talk about active imaging where we're illuminating our uh, target with a laser. And so we want, those, we want to know where those photons are. The absorption is going to absorb that light. The scattering is going to send that light in other directions. Um, and so that affects our ability to uh, get light to the target and to get that back to us. In the case of turbulence, um, this is an example with phase screen. So the index of refraction changes due to the turbulence and changes the direction of that light. And I like to think about it as phase changes results in intensity changes with distance. Um, that's called scintillation. And so now our light is going in different ways than we want it to go um, and is effect affecting our ability to send that light out and receive it. Um, but before I get too far into this talk, I want to talk a little bit about where I work um, and why some of these problems are important to us. Um, so I work at the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C. Um, this is looking at NRL. In the distance over the Potomac River is uh, Reagan National Airport, DCA. So if you've ever flown into DC, DCA, um, we're right across the river. You see us when you're flying in. Um, so we are the research laboratory for the Navy and the Marine Corps. So each uh, DOD, Air Force, Army, each one has their own research laboratory. Um, NRL is the oldest. We are celebrating our 100th birthday this summer, so big deal. Very excited about that. Um, so our main uh, headquarters is in Washington, D.C., and then we have locations in Stennis Space Center, Mississippi, and Monterey, California. Um, so this was pretty interesting to me. So when you think about creating a research laboratory for the government or for the Navy, who comes up with that idea? Um, so I am not active duty. Um, I am a civilian engineer. And the idea came from Thomas Edison. He said the government should maintain a great research laboratory. In this could be developed all the techniques of military and naval progression without any vast expense. Um, so this was in 1915 that he came up with the idea. And so prior to this, um, there were no research laboratories of this kind. So Edison said, we should have a laboratory that's on the water where a ship could be docked near a large city and run by civilians rather than the military, which is kind of interesting because that's contrary to what we think of um, military active duty. Often we think of them rotating their bases and where they're located and civilians. We are there for the long term. There's a stable workforce developing long-term science applications. Um, so Thomas Edison proposed it. Congress said yes to that. They appropriated the money. And then NRL opened in 1923. Um, so the original uh, divisions were radio and sound. Um, but soon after that came the physical optics division, as well as some others. So um, we have grown since then. There are, I don't even know how many to count, but numerous different divisions at the Naval Research Laboratory. So I am in the optical sciences division, but I have highlighted in blue the different divisions that I work with and people in my branch work with. Um, so optics does not just occur in the optical sciences division. There are people working optics in many, many of the divisions at NRL, um, and we work with them um, all the time. So I've talked to people today about what's going on in plasma physics at NRL um, and some of these other areas as well, electronic sciences. So there's a lot of work where we collaborate. So if you know or work with people at the Naval Research Laboratory, we probably collaborate with them as well um, and always looking for collaboration. Um, so who works in optics? So presumably you guys are getting degrees in optics here. Um, most of the people that work in the optical sciences division have PhDs, 77%. So it's a very unique environment to work in where everybody is an expert in their field. So they might be a material scientist or a uh, physics background or optics or mechanical engineering, and everybody is an expert um, in a different field. And yet we all work together on various related projects. 
Um, and so I want to give a call out to a couple things. So if you are a graduate student, I highly recommend you apply for fellowships. And you can come talk to me about this afterwards. But there's two that I want to specifically call out. The National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship and the SMART Fellowship. Um, both of these are DOD funded uh, fellowships that pay for your graduate education with stipends. Um, and they are really prestigious and it's a great opportunity that now your advisor does not have to pay for you and it's an opportunity for you to get paid independently to do research um, that does not have any strings attached to it really. So it's, it's a really great opportunity. Um, and NRL just became a sponsoring facility for SMART this past year. So we can now take SMART scholars. Um, internships, postdocs, and employment. Um, if you are looking for a summer internship, the time has passed. <laughs> summer internships, our applications are due November 1st. Um, that is because you have to be qualified for a security clearance to come work at NRL, um, and you have to be a U.S. citizen or a dual citizen. Um, but please keep this in mind in the future. Um, postdocs, that's an ongoing opportunity. So if you're interested in a postdoc opportunity, please come and talk to me. And we also have positions available for civilian employees. So um, please talk to me. And if you apply to any of these, I highly recommend you reach out to a point of contact. It will get lost in the ether <laughs> if you don't email somebody. So that's my recommendation and words of advice for applying for internships and postdocs. Okay, so let's get back to the science here. So in summary, we, we, we looked at what are some uncontrolled environments, turbulence, obscurations, underwater, and fog. Um, we want to, the kind of work that I want to do is impact how light propagates and is detected in these uncontrolled environments. Um, maybe they're controlled by nature, maybe they're controlled by somebody else, but I want to be able to propagate light and know what is going on with that light in these environments. And why is that important, especially from a Navy perspective? Um, some of the application areas that I work in are imaging, communications, countermeasures, and directed energy. Um, all of these, we can use a laser um, to be able to image, to communicate um, countermeasures, how we need to understand how we're using lasers and then how people are countering our technology and then directed energy. So the talk today is mainly going to on, focus on the imaging and the directed energy applications and how do those play out in our research and our objectives here. So when we think of an active electro-optic system, we have our illuminator and our detector and ultimately we would like to illuminate the target and detect that um, return signal. Um, but turbulence may be present, and that's going to mess up the light that is going from the illuminator to the target as well as the light that is coming back to the detector. We may have obscuration that's blocking the light that's going to the detector, or we may have scattering. And then the light that is illuminating, we have backscatter, we have the direct component that we're trying to access, and then the forward scatter. And so now all of that is causing uh, interference on what we're trying to detect in our detector. And hopefully we don't have all these things together. We don't want the scattering, the occlusions, and turbulence to mess everything up together. Um, but we need to be able to understand how to work in these environments. So let me take these two application areas of intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, which I abbreviate as ISR, and directed energy. And let's look at how each of these plays out. So in turbulence, what am I trying to do from an ISR perspective? I'm trying to recover undistorted imagery in that turbulent environment. I care about the image that I'm acquiring. From a directed energy perspective, I'm trying to direct that light to a specific target. So I want to pre-compensate for that outgoing beam to maximize the energy on target. So that's what I need to think about from a turbulence perspective. Um, in the case of occlusions, um, from an ISR perspective, I would like to recover the imagery in partially occluded conditions. From a directed energy standpoint, I need to shape that light to avoid the occlusions in order to maximize that energy and target. And finally, from scattering perspective, um, ISR, I want to recover that imagery in the degraded visual environment. And from a directed energy standpoint, shape that beam to minimize the scattering from the degraded visual environment. 
So these are all different topics um, that I'd like to examine, and I'm going to do that um, from the question of digital holography. So the question is, how does digital holography allow us to operate in adverse conditions? Um, so we'll start with a slight history lesson. Um, so the first hologram um, was uh, created in 1948, and I, I noted this is a picture from um, the manuscript, but I wanted to note um, some of the experimental parameters here. So the coherence length of this electron gun was 1.1 uh, millimeters with a pinhole of 3 microns and objects that were limited to 1 centimeter in diameter. So there was a lot of constraints here with a very small coherence length. So this was a very limited approach. And we all know what happened after that in the mention of the laser um, allowed us to really expand our ability to do holography. So in 1963, um, this is an example of the first off-axis hologram, which really um, eased some of the constraints that we have in recording these interference patterns um, and recreating these hologram patterns. Um, so not that history repeats itself, but you might be asking, Okay, Abby, we're talking about fog and holography. Has this been done before? And as you notice, the off-axis hologram was created in 1963. Shortly after that, in 1967, appeared this paper in JOSA, um, Holographic Fog Penetration. So almost from the invention of holography, people were thinking about using holography for imaging through fog. Um, and so this paper is kind of interesting. Um, it used a CW um, holography setup with soapy water um, and gave a qualitative comparison between the results. Um, so again, not actually fog, even though that's in the title. Um, but they recognized that scattering particles would not be coherent with respect to the reference light. Um, and so that's an important observation early on in the role of holography here. A couple years later, in 1972, um, another paper came out in optical communications, image holography through convective fog. Um, in this experiment, again, they did not use fog, um, but they simulated that with a frosted mylar sheet. Um, and this is an image from their paper here. So what they uh, noted is that they were able to reconstruct um, the image here on the bottom right um, with moving fog. And so they s stated that the fog particles experience a Doppler frequency shift and are not coherent with the reference. Um, and so even early on, people have been using holography to be able to image through fog. So this is not new, but we want to be able to, uh, in our work, be able to image through uh, thicker, deeper fog um, is one of our applications. Um, so as many of you are uh, optics uh, students, digital holography should be familiar to you, but I want to give a refresher here. So what we want to do is we want to record the interference between two beams of light, light reflected from the target and light from a local reference here. And as I mentioned, we may have a distorted wavefront, maybe from turbulence um, in that light reflected from the tor uh, target. So we're going to record those interference beams. Um, and if we look at the math here, we want this conjugate target beam, um, and we want to be able to pull that out. We do that digitally with digital holography. So we record our hologram. We record those fringes on the pattern. We take an inverse Fourier transform of that, window out the term that we want digitally. Um, and if this is a point source target, so a point source meaning um, it's not an extended target, um, the detected phase is solely due to aberrations in the beam path. And in that case, we can... Um, when we inverse Fourier transform that, the phase is the phase due to the turbulence. We can put on a spatial light modulator or deformable mold mirror, and we can conjugate that. Um, and so by conjugating that, um, using that spatial light modulator, we can um, pre-correct for that distorted wavefront and then send that back um, to the target, um, which will result in a um, corrected beam. Um, so at NRL, we have designed real-time turbulence-corrected systems. Um, you can see all the components there. Our laser shores, we use beam splitters to split that into two paths, send out some of that light to the target. Um, in this particular setup, we use a digital light projector, um, which is an amplitude-only device, um, to um, do our uh, phase correction here. 
Um, and then there's a second beam that acts as our reference beam and record those on the camera and then run this in a real time loop. And so we've taken this on field tests outdoors. Um, and this is a particular test I mentioned we're doing point source targets. So this was a retro reflector target. And in real time, we correct for the turbulence. And what you can see, this is not a video, but in, in, in motion, the fringes that we see on the screen as a result of being projected on the digital light projector move based on the turbulence in the atmosphere. Um, the next case is an extended target. So let's say we're illuminating an area, um, not a point source anymore. And so what we need, this is a little more complicated case because now when you take your hologram, you Fourier transform it, if you're going to look at um, the amplitude and phase characteristics of that beam, the phase now is properties of the target itself as well as phase due to the atmospheric turbulence. And so what we need to do is basically distinguish what is the phase from the turbulence and what is the phase from the object. Um, so you can Fourier transform that and recover what the coherent image is. It's still blurred until you separate out the phase from the turbulence, which will give you the sharpened image. And so in order to sh distinguish between the phase due to the object and the phase due to the turbulence, one method that we use is called image sharpening. And so we do this in an uh, a uh, nonlinear optimization approach where we uh, basically ping pong back and forth between the pupil plane uh, field and the image plane intensity and substitute in uh, estimates of the phase correction due to turbulence using Zernike polynomials or deformable mirror influence functions such that when we apply that phase correction we see how does that change um, what's called the sharpness metric, which is the sum of the intensity raised to some power. And that, as that metric changes, we can see um, as that it will increase as we are sh um, sharpening that to apply the phase correction. Um, so again, if you're not familiar with digital holography, the benefit is we have access to the phase, the complex field, the amplitude, and the phase. But now we have to distinguish that um, to be able to determine what is due to turbulence. And this allows us to do that. So um, because everything is digital in terms of post-processing, we can correct for specific regions um, in these extended targets. So if we have a bar target here, we may say, OK, let's look at this particular region that we would like to sharpen and correct for the phase due to that region. Um, we, can, we can do that digitally for that phase correction. Um, and here's another example of that as well, the uncompensated beam and the compensated beam. So that's turbulence. Let's talk a little bit about occlusion. So just a reminder, with occlusions, we want to recover imagery in partially occluded conditions. And when, from a directed energy standpoint, we want to maximize that energy on target. So here's an example. Um, we send an illumination beam. It's filling a large area. Some of that light gets through those holes and gets to the target. Um, and so some of that light is going to be reflected back. So we're going to lose a lot of that light um, due to the obscuration if our goal is to image that on the target. Um, so what we would like to do is reshape that beam just to send that light through those holes. Um, so what we've done um, is recorded a hologram. Um, so that light has gone to the target. We've interfered that with a local reference. You can see that interference pattern um, in that zoom in plot there. And so Here's just kind of some of our lab results here. So we've initially illuminated with a random speckle pattern. Um, and then we've, in the next frame, we've taken that um, hologram that was recorded, applied the phase to a spatial light modulator, and then re-illuminated that. And now you can see that the pattern that's re-projected out um, looks very similar um, to the whole pattern that we'd like to create. Um, and so the top images are in the obscuration plane, the bottom images in the target plane, and you can see we were able to increase the power in the target plane by re-illuminating with these uh, holographic patterns. Here's another example. Um, we're going to have our obscuration be a case of rods this time. Um, and so again, we're initially illuminating with a random 
laser speckle pattern. There's the photograph of the rods. Um, so the light has to go around those rods and then we're able to record that um, in the target plane. So different ways that we can use holography. So it's not just turbulence. Uh, obscuration is an example for that. And finally, let's talk about scattering. So again, from an imaging perspective, we want to be able to recover those imagery. Um, from a directed energy standpoint, we want to minimize the scattering um, to get the most energy um, on target. So there's a lot of challenges when imaging in these scattering environments. So when we think about the properties, optical properties of light, the spatial temporal coherence phase and polarization. Um, what we're starting with, um, with our coherent light is the characteristics of the ballistic light. We have narrow spatial extent, narrow temporal extent, it's coherent, it's got a narrow phase distribution and polarized. As we're going through scattering media, we lose a lot of that uh, optical information when it becomes diffuse light. Now it's uh, spatially broad, temporally broad, incoherent, it's got random phase and depolarized. We're losing that information that we want um, that can tell us about our target and our imaging properties. Um, so we need to be able to separate out, well there's many different techniques, but the technique that we're going to utilize is separating out the ballistic light return from the single scattering and multiple scattering returns. Um, and so time-gated holography allows us to do that. So there's a lot of advantages that we're utilizing simultaneously here. So um, as was mentioned in some of the early papers about imaging through fog, we are coherence gating. So um, when we interfere um, light together, those diffuse photons are not going to coherently interfere. Um, angular gating, so um, we are interfering that local reference, um, and so snake photons will be excluded because of scattering angle. Um, polarization, um, only photons with the same polarization will form interference fringes, and then temporal gating. Um, we're going to use a time-gated holography approach, and so things that are not um, in that temporal will be excluded as well. So this is a way that we can remove those scattering photons. So here's a diagram of the imaging setup here. Again, um, we have a fiber laser. Um, we split that into two paths, one to serve as our local reference and one to go through our uh, fog chamber or uh, water chamber here um, to go through our target. And then we've timed those pulses such that we can gate them on our gated detector. So let's go through some results. So um, here's some results um, when we have two different attenuation lengths, attenuation of 8 and 10.8. Um, so this is a single frame. So we've recorded the frame um, at these two different conditions and recovered the imagery from that. So the shape that we're trying to create here is the letter X. And we can recover that with a single frame um, at attenuation 8. And in the 10.8 case, it's just noisy. We just, we don't see anything. So in order to recover at higher attenuation lengths, we'd like to increase the signal to noise ratio. Um, we can do that by averaging multiple frames together. So the first approach is what's called incoherent averaging. So we're going to average intensities together. So we now take 64 frames and we incoherently average those together. And this is the result. So now but that incoherent averaging reduces that speckle noise that you see. Um, so we're now getting a better looking X at attenuation length of 8. Um, and if you kind of squint, maybe you could pretend that you see an X at 10.8. Um, but it's, it's still pretty noisy there. So we would like to increase that signal to noise ratio even more. Um, instead of averaging incoherently, we can do that by coherent averaging. Um, and so here's the difference here. Instead of uh, looking at a signal to noise increase of square root of n, the coherent averaging gives us um, an n increase um, in, in our signal to noise. So we have two different approaches that we've done for that. The first one being a maximum likelihood minimization, because in order to coherently average things together, we need all of the fields to be in phase with one another. Um, and so this is uh, how this maximum likelihood approach works. So if you look at the pictures here, we have our incoherent results and then our coherent 
um, results. And you can see that both cases, well, the top case for the uh, attenuation length of eight, it brought down the noise. So we're getting a much um, stronger uh, representation of the signal. But something seems a little off um, in the 10.8 case. So we've coherently averaged these phases, but this mo uh, maximum likelihood minimization approach, instead of coherently adjusting the phases to reveal what the target was, in this case, it coherently averaged all the noise together. And so now our object completely disappears, and now we are just seeing the noise. Um, so something went wrong there. We need to improve that. Um, so we tried a different approach, a singular value decomposition approach. And so what this approach does is it breaks the field down to its constituent modes. So a desired field, a coherent scatter, noise, et cetera. Um, and again, this is accounting for being able to constructually co uh, average um, coherently the different um, modes that we have. So this is a breakdown of these singular value decomposition terms um, for the attenuation length of 8 and an attenuation of 10.8. Um, and you can see the first two terms are where the most um, of the information is contained. So here's what those two different modes look like. So uh, we'll start up here on the left. So attenuation 8 mode 1 for the singular value decomposition is the target itself. So we get a nice, crisp, clear uh, version of the target. If we look at mode 1 for attenuation length of 10.8, that's where the noise is. It was the dominant signal there, um, and so um, we see that noise term revealed. But if we look at the second uh, singular v uh, value decomposition term, um, for attenuation 8, it is the coherent noise, which we're now able to segregate out. But now, for the attenuation of 10.8, we see the second mode is actually the target itself. So this allowed us to um, extract from the noise the target signal. And now we're able to reconstruct with much higher fidelity um, that target than we were able to otherwise. So here's a comparison of these different terms, the incoherent averaging, the coherent um, averaging and then the singular value decomposition. Um, so <coughs> this modal uh, decomposition allows us to separate out the signal from the coherent, uh, coherent noise sources and outperform these other techniques. So to wrap up, um, <coughs> we really do care about these different in imaging environments. Turbulence, obscurations, degraded environments, whether that's fog or turbid water. And so the question I proposed at the beginning was how does digital holography allow us to operate in adverse conditions? And it comes down to what we have access to. So it allows us access to the electromagnetic field, the amplitude and phase, which allows us to have beam control, to do imagery construction in the presence of these different conditions, turbulence, occlusions, and scattering. So thank you for this time this morning, or this afternoon. Happy to take questions. And I will leave with this, um, that we are hiring. Um, so again, whether you're interested in internships, postdocs, um, or a future position as a government research scientist, more than happy to talk about that and answer any questions as well. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this was a very great talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, we are open for questions. <clears throat> yeah. Airplanes can uh, fly in clouds and uh, dense fog and uh, still can see what is around them. So why is it uh, different in the case of ships uh, in the fog? Why can't the ships use the same radar technology and see what's around them? Sure. So, I mean, there's different technologies. Radar, um, so what we would like to do ultimately um, is high resolution imaging. So the different kinds of wave bands that we operate in are going to give us different resolution of objects. So yes, we will be able to identify other things around them, but in order to get high resolution images, we'd really like to work um, in visible or SWIR um, wave bands and turn it in. Sure. I don't know how that still happens, but it still does. Yeah. Can you, can you go to your slide where you showed the, the sharpness algorithm? 
Sure. How far back did I skip it? Sure. So the way that this works is we have a field um, because we ha we've, we've done holography, we have access to the complex field. Um, so with that field, we can digitally propagate that to any plane. Um, so in the pupil plane, in our holographic setups, we record in the pupil plane. Um, but we can digitally propagate to any plane we want. So we digitally propagate that to the plane where the target would be. Um, using usually angular spectrum propagation. And in that plane, before applying any phase correction, you're going to get a blurry object. Um, we calculate, we sum up all those pixels, um, raise that to a power, and we get a single number as that sharpness metric. Um, now we propagate back um, to the pupil plane. We apply a phase correction term to that. Um, and then iterate back. Um, and so this isn't a nonlinear optimization routine where we're trying to minimize um, or maximize, depending on how we've set it up, um, that sharpness metric. And so with each um, iteration to the optimizer, we're adjusting the weights on that arbitrary phase to estimate what phase we put in that pupil plane will give us that sharpest, uh, sharpest metric. How is your estimator, uh, you know, making the right call? Sure, it could get stuck in some local minima, um, yeah. but um, most of the time, it's it's okay. Um, you could have different starting guesses and see which solution works to the best result, um, but most of the time, it does work its way to a final solution. I mean, there's time <laughs> um, is a limitation. Um, you know, this example that I'm showing here is only using one phase screen. In reality, if we're doing volume turbulence, like we're, ex we're considering a real scene, we would want to represent um, multiple phase screens in that space. And then now, if you're trying to optimize over multiple phase screens with this type of technique, you would need to propagate that phase to multiple planes and then simultaneously optimize for multiple phases um, at each plane. So it can get very complex very easily. Um, but in general, um, the solution worked well. I actually also have a question to that. So the phase that you show here, like a pretty clear phase, right? So sure. what do you do when the scattering is so severe that you have like severe speckles, for sure. example, and you don't have such a clear uh, phase from anymore? I might mm. answer that in a couple different ways. So no. um, one thing we think about is how well are we able to correct? So if we are using a deformable mirror in practice to correct for that, um, we may want to limit our face correction to whatever our hardware can do. Um, so um, this example here is, is relatively high frequency. It's not completely um, smooth, um, but we could do a point-by-point -point correction. Um, in experience, I have found that maybe this answers your question as well. In order to avoid stagnation and ending up in local minima, it is better if you do a bootstrapping approach where you start with low order terms and work your way to a point by point solution um, instead of starting with a point by point solution first. I have kind of a long question. Yeah. So, like you showed with elite the Pagus holography, mm -hmm. um, that emerged as you know, a kind of communication strategy for uh, solving the quadratic phase problem. Mm -hmm. like, how are you going to get the, the signal intensity? 
That's the discipline of holography. Yeah. In parallel, you have the discipline of face retrieval that solves a quadratic problem in a different way. Yeah. Lately, you have a lot of, you know, like the stuff that George Barbsace has been doing with mm -hmm. uh, neural uh, face retrieval and holography yep. mixed together. Yeah. So I, I kind of wonder if the field of holography and uh, face retrieval are, are really distinct. You know, and I'm wondering, like, what do you see as the future of, the, of what it means to measure with coherent fields and whether holography is really a thing anymore? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, you know, from a sponsor standpoint, um, a sponsor wants the least constraints on the hardware as possible. And when I go to a sponsor and I say, I need a long coherence length laser and I know you want me to do long range imaging, they're going to say there's a lot of constraints to that system. Um, so if we can get away from long coherence length systems and do things that are more reliant on intensity based systems such as phase retrieval that allow us to recover that phase, I think that is more digestible to some people. Um, but in cases where we don't have constraints and we can use, you know, long coherence length systems, I think there's a lot of advantages here. But again, a lot of times people want simple solutions that aren't constrained by hardware. Yeah, I guess what I'm really getting to is that you talk still about <laughs> that there's these two extremes of long coherence length and mm -hmm. long and, and phase retrieval. It seems like the distinction between those is kind of collapsing. That, sure. That, that you could have a mix of both really in the system. Yeah. Yeah. Good things to think about. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for your interesting talk. Do you know how special uh, beam shaping, or for example, using beams with orbital and angular momentum, can help with these problems that you mentioned? Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, can it? Can well, it? I mean, I'll talk a little bit about that. So, um, a different field of work that I've been working on is orbital angular momentum, and I didn't discuss any of that in my talk today. Um, so. In terms of application areas and work that I've done in orbital angular momentum, we have done that um, with a communications application in mind. I kind of skipped some of the communications applications. Um, but there's many uses of orbital angular momentum. People use orbital angular momentum or vortex beams for particle traps. Um, people use them uh, vortex phase plates for coronagraph work. Um, and the other area, I think, is communications. Um, I didn't talk about any of that in this talk. I, I think there's people in the community that would say that um, orbital angular momentum beams, Laguerre Gauss beams or Hermite Gauss beams, can uh, Bessel Gauss beams, I guess Bessel Gauss beams might be the best example, have some pseudo non diffracting characteristics to them. And so I think people have looked that, at that characteristic and said they have more turbulence resistance than normal diffracting beams. Um, so I think, you know, I guess maybe back to your question of turbulence, I think people are saying can we use vortex beams as turbulence? mitigators in the sense that because they're pseudo non-diffracting beams, they're more resistant to turbulence. Again, I think they will still be affected by turbulence and then that's where you want to do some kind of wavefront sensing or turbulence correction. So could we combine those two in terms of being able to sense the wavefront here in addition to using overlaying momentum beams? Possibly. Long answer to I think your your question, but I I, I hope that answered it. Yeah. yeah. Can you do the reverse problem and use turbulence to create camouflage to avoid being detected? In the South China Sea, for example. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that that's that's a good question. You know, kind of like the fog example. Um, anytime there is something that affects us, um, it's going to affect our adversary as well. So if turbulence is a problem for us to see through, it's the problem for somebody else to see through as well. So uh, 
you know, I would say normally if we're creating turbulence, we would probably be using heat to do that. And they may have other kinds of sensors that will just say, oh, I now can see what that is. <laughs> so I think one solution might cause problems in other types of sensors. This direction, yeah. so you showed um, these experiments where you image around occlusions, yes. right? where you yeah. kind of direct the light around the occlusion. Yeah. Um, have you thought about this in a context where um, you as the imager don't want to be detected? So you kind of you know, direct the light around somebody who wants to image you. I have not done work in no. that area, but I know there's plenty of work in that area being done. and I'm always fascinated to see what people actually, are doing. No. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you have any work going on in using AI for your um, for your face correction? That that's rather, a, rather than wavefront sensor, or maybe a complementary. That question? that is a great question. So um, again, I didn't talk about that in this work today, but I think. AI and machine learning is attaching itself to everything. <laughs> um, and it's attaching itself to this work as well. Um, so again, I didn't talk about that in here, but um, we are using machine learning for wavefront correction. So a project I did not talk about um, that we have patented is using a Shack Hartman wavefront sensor. So you might have a Shack Hartman wavefront sensor in your lab now. We have the small Thor Labs ones in our lab. Um, so Shack Hartman wave sen front sensors use slope deviations um, to calculate that uh, wave front error. Um, what we've done is use those X and Y uh, deviations of those spots plus the intensity information that we get from that Shack Hartman in a machine learning algorithm which gives us better information and higher fidelity wa wave front corrections than we get with a pure Shack Hartman. So we're using the same hardware, using the outputs differently, and we're getting better results. So um, I'd have to think about how we're going to apply that to some of this work that I presented today. But yeah, we're incorporating into a lot of what we're doing. Any other questions? Yeah. I, guess, uh, I, I saw you mentioned something about polarization. Yeah. Um, what if? I guess I'm not familiar with the turbulence. In, um, can you use polarization to add an extra degree of freedom on your constraints? I don't know if turbulence is polarization. I'm, I'm not a polarization expert. Yeah, I mean, I, I was using it in the context of when we are interfering two beams together, we're interfering beams with the same polarization. Um, and so if the target depolarizes the light or something else depolarizes the light, that's effectively taking away some of those photons that were interfering together. Um, so we use the, the polarization properties without even thinking about it when we interfere that light with a local reference. I, I haven't thought about that. <laughs>